I want to thank everyone for persevering. Perseverance has been a theme. I think last year it'll probably be a theme this year uh, when we look at the cell and gene therapy sector, but people persevered to get here uh, through all sorts of weather travails, I know. And it could be an eventful week for the cell and gene therapy sector and also the weather that we're all battling. Um, my name is Tim Hunt. I'm the Chief Executive Officer at the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine. Welcome to Biotech Showcase. Welcome to JP Morgan. For those of us that haven't been here in a little while, it's great to see so many colleagues and uh, to get together. I think most of you are familiar with the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine, but for those who are not, we are generally viewed as the global voice of the cell and gene therapy sector. We represent biotechnology companies, medical and research centers, tool and service providers, and patient organizations. And we've got about 475 members, a little over that, um, uh, worldwide. Our focus is largely around convening the sector, and I think of it as building a robust arm community within cell and gene therapy, providing data and analysis, engaging key external stakeholders, enabling the development of advanced therapies, and I'll talk a little bit more today about modernizing healthcare systems and where we see that in 2023. That's a theme that we're really building on this year. Let me start, though, by talking about what I think is our true north, the patients we all collectively serve. And there's a photo here of a patient, a sickle cell patient named Jimmy Olaher. I'll come back to Jimmy in just a moment. Um, but as I've, I've been on the job now for about four months, and I've given a number of talks, and, and what I commonly say is that sometimes we get so excited about the technology that we're working on because the technology is so exciting. What we can do is just breathtaking. But sometimes we forget about the burden of disease for patients, right? And I think it's always important for us to remember and to remind our external stakeholders that for far too many of our patients, millions around the world, the status quo too often represents death or serious disability. And I was reminded of this last week. I was on a, a prep call for a panel I'm going to do in a few days. And there were a few patient advocates on there. And one was a young woman with sickle cell disease. And she'd formed a small patient organization, a really kind of cool, cool patient organization. And as I thought about it, I thought, she's probably the seventh or eighth sickle cell patient I've met in the last several years. And then it struck me three of those had passed away and they were all younger than me. Two of them were in their 30s, right? Sickle cell is a devastating disease. It is extremely burdensome for patients, and as I said, too often represents death or serious disability, which is why it's good to celebrate good news within sickle cell, which we're gonna talk about today a little bit. Uh, that leads me to, to Jimmy. I met Jimmy at the CRISPR Therapeutics opening of their global headquarters and R&D facility uh, back in September. I was only a few weeks on the job. And, um, and Jimmy spoke, and it was very moving to hear his story, his journey about the pain crises, the hospitalizations, the morphine he was on, um, the constant infusions, the IV. He had a rough case of sickle cell disease. And then he heard about the CRISPR therapeutics and Vertex sickle cell clinical trial and he was able to be treated in September of 2020. And as Jimmy said, you know, today he, other than going for routine clinical trial follow-up, he does not have any clinical interventions around sickle cell disease. And he said he and his wife were so optimistic about the future and where, and where his health and where they think they can go as a family, they decided to have, to expand the family and they have twin girls who are pictured here with their older brother. So it's a great story of hope. And when you think about a devastating disease like sickle cell, we'll talk about that in a moment, the good news is this year we think hope is on the way. So transformative therapies for sickle cell disease and hemophilia have arrived. The science is advancing. <clears throat> the sector is continuing to mature, which is great. I think most of you know we saw 
gene therapies for hemophilia A by Biomarin and hemophilia B by, by Unicure and CSL Bearing were approved um, and in the U.S. and in Europe, and we'll, we'll see full approvals, we hope, this year in both uh, geographies. Two gene therapies, we believe, we're hopeful, will be approved uh, uh, for sickle cell disease in the United States, one by Bluebird Bio, and then the one I mentioned uh, from CRISPR and Vertex, which is great news for patients. And then the way we think about it, you know, in many ways, the era of larger patient populations has arrived, and there's a real question about our healthcare systems ready. <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit about some of the scientific advances now that we've seen. And if you, if you pan back, many people have been in the industry for a number of years, right? If you go back 20 years, 25 years, there were years when you thought about gene therapy in particular and cell therapy as well, where the, it, the, the progress for patients seemed like a crawl. It was a long, hard slog for some of the prominent academics that have pioneered amazing technology and the, the companies that are out there that are trying to translate the science into clinical advances. It was a crawl. Well, then, about five years ago, we began to walk, I would say. We started to see more and more approvals five, seven years ago. Really meaningful developments. And I would argue in 2022, we started to jog. We started to make more meaningful progress for patients. And this slide indicates a number of very important milestones in 2022 for patients. We saw Legend and, and Janssen, SCAR-T approved in the US and Europe. Uh, I mentioned uh, Biomarin's Roctavian approval in Europe for, for hemophilia. PTC therapeutics, Substasia in Europe, Unicure and, and Bearings, uh, Hemgenics I, I referred to a moment ago, Faring tucked in an approval at the end of the year, and Atara Biotherapeutics received the first approval of an allogeneic T cell therapy anywhere in the world in Europe, a major technological advance that we think really portends very bright things for that important area of the field. And then on the right, these are therapies uh, approved in new geographies or expanded labels for new indications. I won't go through them all, but a lot of very important advances. So a, a terrific year in 2022. And when we turn the page and start looking at 2023, I would say it's as bright and maybe brighter in the scope of things uh, this year with a lot of very notable firsts on the near-term horizon, right? So in the U.S., I call it the our five by five by five. So it took over five years. We received five approvals in the United States for gene therapies for rare diseases, right? It went from sort of that crawl to a walk. And now in the span of five years, we've had a total of five gene therapies approved for rare diseases. Well, this year we're hopeful we'll see five more. We'll double the number in one year, which is tremendous progress for patients. I mentioned the CRISPR therapeutics and Vertex sickle cell drug. That would mark the first approval of a CRISPR-based gene editing therapeutic. If you think about the quick arc of CRISPR as a technology um, in the last 10, 12 years, it's really meaningful progress. Um, the first approval of adoptive cell therapy for a solid tumor, another major milestone. I mentioned Atara's uh, uh, program, the first U.S. approval for an allogeneic T cell therapy may happen. Um, and then the first approval for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, a gene therapy by Sarepta, which would be very meaningful for that patient community. So a lot of very notable firsts that we see coming up potentially this year. And then this represents the kind of sum total of U.S. and European regulatory decisions that we see for the year. In the kind of darker purple, you see the United States decisions, and in the orange, we see European decisions. So there's a, a sum total of 18 on the horizon, and there's some notable ones in there. I won't go through them all, but Crystal Bio uh, has a therapy, a gene therapy for EB that would be a major advance for patients that could get approved in the U.S. and Europe. Pfizer has a hemophilia B program that's got a lot of potential, and many others. So again, in many ways, hope is on the way, we believe, for our patients. And as, again, as we turn the page and enter 2023, 
Um, when we scan across the globe, we see 2,220 clinical trials that are active. Great news for our patients, right? 43% of those have sites in North America. 38% have sites that are enrolling patients in the Asia Pacific region and 18% in Europe. Um, last year, there were 254 new clinical trials initiated. Good news, right? About half of those were in Asia Pacific. In total, for phase three clinical trials, we see 202. Again, great news uh, for patients, which should fuel even more approvals in the next few years. And then interestingly, there are more than 100 clinical trials ongoing around the world for gene editing technology. When you look at the more than 2,000 trials, 58% of those trials have potential applications in a prevalent disorder, and 60% of the trials focus on oncology, equally split between solid and liquid tumors. Great advances. Okay, cell and gene therapy investment. I said the weather out there was a little bumpy and people persevered to get here. Yeah, it spills over. I think of it as we need to see, we hopefully will see continued resilience in the face of significant macro headwinds. Um, let's get to the good news. We saw 11% growth in the number of developers out there working in service of our patients. It ticked upward to 1,457 developers globally working on cell and gene therapy. That's terrific news. And a lot of that was in the form of uh, uh, startups being spun out by uh, academic centers and venture, the venture capital community. Uh, market factors depress public equity performance is the title of the slide. I think you all know this probably far better than I do. Depress is a reasonable word, I think, to characterize the last year. It was a tough year, for, for sure. And this just shows some of the major indices, the biotech, NASDAQ index, and we overlaid it with our RMAT index, our gene therapy index, and our cancer index. Um, obviously, it was, a tough, it was a tough year last year. That said, in some ways, I think context is always comforting. Um, while we had extreme highs in 2020 and 2021 in that $20 billion to $23 billion range for investments, uh, last year really kind of normalized back down into that 2018, 2019 area. Now, there, weren't num there were not enough IPOs that we all would have preferred and raising money was difficult, on difficult terms. Nevertheless, there was a way to, rate, to get access to capital even though it wasn't, it wasn't comfortable for many of us. And then, um, I touched on this at the beginning, a lot of what we've talked about at ARM in the past, <coughs> and we'll, <coughs> excuse me, continue to talk about in the future, is the real need as the sector matures, as the pipeline continues to develop, as we see more of approvals for these really important therapies, we're gonna to continue to talk about, both in the United States and in Europe, the real need to modernize healthcare systems to ensure patient access. And I'm gonna take a few minutes just to talk about that. So again, the science behind cell and gene therapies is progressing rapidly to the immense benefit of patients. It's a highly dynamic time for the healthcare systems. Yes, regulators, right, that are grappling with really groundbreaking innovations that we're all bringing forward, and certainly payers are also struggling at times. Well, now larger patient populations than we've seen in the past are arriving, again, in the form of sickle cell disease and hemophilia on the chart we show it compared to some other very important disorders, but relatively smaller patient populations. So will these new therapies be a forcing function that really makes some, including payers, sit up and really think about systemic reform, modernization of how they do business? Um, that's part of what we're encouraging them to do. So really, can they modernize to keep pace with the science? In the United States, um, we see a 
calling back to the slide I showed a few minutes ago, 14 regulatory decisions are expected. You know, and I think give credit where credit is due. Peter Marks and the team at the FDA and CBER, you know, have sort of led the way in some, in some areas by thinking about how they're gonna redesign OTAT, right? And turn it into a super office, which we think is a welcome development. He's spoken openly about the critical need to fill some of those vacancies that they have there. Um, PADUFA has, the new PADUFA has added 100 new employees over the next few years, which we think is great. Um, and they're making some progress on CMC, including an all-day, some may be familiar, an all-day CMC potency assay workshop that we led with ASGCT, the American Society of Gene and Cell Therapy, and the FDA. I attended, Mike Lemicky on our team really was sort of the, the backbone of the whole thing. Peter Marks and his team, to their credit, came and stayed the full day for eight hours and really engaged with about 15 developers and some very prominent academics. So that's the kind of leaning in that we think is needed, not just in the US, but over in Europe as well. And you know, quest, look, questions will linger about US payer readiness. That's Medicaid, it's Medicare, it's commercial plans. Progress in some areas, but again, I think we have a forcing function that's coming pretty quickly. You know, in Europe, I was, um, I was pleased to attend a briefing we did in November in Brussels at the European Parliament. And um, I think it's helpful to speak truth to friends. And so when, when I was over there and gave some remarks, I said, listen, Europe clearly has been a leader in cell and gene therapy going back decades, right? Um, a lot of major innovations, top medical centers, a talented workforce, on and on and on. And at the same time, we see the European Union as a flashing yellow light of caution for patients. Why? Right? There have been roadblocks in reimbursement that I think we're all familiar with. That's complicated patient access. Seven of the 24 ATMPs have been withdrawn from the market in Europe, primarily for economic reasons. Um, and clinical trials and investment is not ideally where we would like to see it. It's been stagnating, and there are only three new phase one clinical trials that we saw in 2022. That's the, the rough news. The good news is there's another choice. There's a fork in the road. And so we think that there is a better path in Europe. And we are encouraging our friends and our colleagues to think about seizing a once, what we think of as a once in a generation opportunity to choose a better road for patients. That really comes primarily in the form of this uh, EU pharmaceutical legislation that's being worked on right now um, and some important provisions in there. The spirit of what we're trying to get across is that, you know, instead of thinking about our technology as the pills of the past, or as I said when I was in Brussels, the small molecules in the 1970s or the early biologics in the 1990s, we really got to think about more of a what does our model really look like and how do we make it fit for purpose. Um, there are things like exempting ATMPs from the GMO requirements that were really built around agricultural products, as we all know, and not our technology. Um, and then they have uh, their hospital exemption provision, which we support in original concept and think is a noble undertaking, um, but there's been some mission creep around it and now it's been expanded and expanded a little bit more. We want it to get back to its original purpose. And then as we look at their European health technology assessment and joint clinical assessment, we're encouraging them really to think about a European-wide guidance for real-world evidence and to uh, decouple our technology from randomized clinical trials with active comparators, to leverage the health data space to collect real world evidence, and to really be collaborative as they think through these joint clinical assessments. So a better path that we're encouraging. Okay, so this is a really important year, as I mentioned, where we'll go from jogging, you know, walking to jogging to, I think, running uh, uh, in service of patients. You know, our Health systems really able, 
to modernize? We'll, we'll learn a lot more this year, or are they stuck a little bit in the past? You know, this is the beginning also of a journey where we're going to learn more about our patients willing to embrace the new technology that we're bringing forward. That's not going to be answered entirely this year, but I think we'll learn a little bit more. And what will that signal for prevalent diseases, perhaps? What are the implications for patients, developers, and investors? We'll learn more. But I think, importantly, there'll be a lot of signals that will get sent, but when you really look at it, it's probably going to take some years for all of this to play out, including over the next I would say five years. Okay, I began with a patient. Let me wrap with a patient. So I met Lucy Elliker um, at our Brussels event. And Lucy um, told a very powerful story about her five-month-old son, Opie, who had leukemia. Um, and like many patients, he went through the standard of care. He went through chemotherapy and a bone marrow transplant as a very young child. And eventually, they, he got switched over to a CAR-T therapy. And um, it was a brutal journey to go through the standard of care. And, you know, Opie now is doing well. He's happy, he's healthy, and Lucy has enormous confidence and faith in the future of his health and his life expectancy. And I was struck when she said, listen, you know, my view is these CAR-Ts need to be a first-line therapy, not a last-line therapy. And the interesting thing is, she said that in November, and I've heard that from two other uh, caregivers of children in the, since November, so three in total. So patients are waiting for life-changing, life-saving treatments that all of you are producing or helping us to produce. We have a unique opportunity to build the future of medicine together as one community. So in closing, you know, there were many years where the field felt like it was crawling arduously forward for patients, little bits of progress, but it was a long slog over the last 20 plus years. But cell and gene therapies picked up the pace. All the work that you did really started to pull forward, and we went to a jog in 2022. We think this is going to be a seminal year to make even more progress, though hurdles, of course, exist. Real running, I think, is attainable, but only if we really help our colleagues. We have to do this. We have to help our colleagues that are payers and regulators modernize the approach to healthcare systems, especially in the United States and Europe. So with that, I am going to end my remarks and introduce, we've got two really cool panels that I know you, you all will enjoy quite a bit. First up, we're going to have an update on gene therapy commercialization. Uh, Devin Smith is going to chair that. He's the CEO of Arbor Biotechnologies and chair at the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine. And on the panel, he's going to have Derek Hicks, Chief Business Officer at Intellia, Matt Capusta, CEO of Unicure, Suma Krishnan, Founder and Chief Operating Officer at Crystal Biotech. That'll be a great panel I know you'll enjoy. And then we'll roll into cell therapy milestones in 2023. Melissa Carpenter will chair that. She's Chief Scientific Officer of Regenerative Medicine at Elevate Bio. And she'll have Abigail Jenkins, President and CEO at Gamita Cell. Adrian Rockcliffe, CEO of Adaptimmune Therapeutics. And Pascal Touchon, President and CEO of Atara. Thank you, enjoy the conference, but don't go anywhere because these are going to be two great sessions. You guys are going to love it. Thank you. <laughs>